are you seeing in those other areas of your life or even around your neighborhood here some of some things that bother you about yeah. synthetic you know drugs absolutely it's, it's very fresh you know last night uh the council uh set some new standards uh, with ordinances revolving synthetic uh, drugs uh when i first you know i'm entering my fourth year on the city council uh the first year of this was just not even a blimp on the radar uh synthetics and over the last three years it's just ballooned out in a, into a true prairie fire of, of an issue and a problem um right now you know and i and, and, I, and I said this uh, openly at the at the meeting last night that i uh, as a provider i struggle with it on a weekly basis uh, uh, in, in our medical centers and uh it's it's a true struggle because one it's legal, uh, and two we can't really track it, um, the active ingredients in it. We can't uh, uh, find out if they're on uh, these medications unless they're openly telling us. But overall picture, I've noticed a decline, especially in our youth. Um, those patients under uh, 30 years old, uh, I've noticed uh, some significant. Uh, issues of decline, uh, especially those patients that sometimes have be, uh, were born or have behavioral health issues, schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, you know, issues with post-traumatic stress syndrome, things like that, that this, by them being on these synthetic uh, drugs, uh, escalates and turns, turns them into people they are not. And uh, uh, it truly saddens me that uh, we've come to this spot. Uh, I think we're very unique. The city of Duluth. I think we're at the forefront of the of the problem. I think this is only starting to get outside in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Milwaukee, Chicago, uh, due to the fact that we have an owner that's openly really pushing this many, this drug, uh, and I think a lot of users are are are, are, are being attracted to our area. Uh, you think users are being attracted to the area because of the accessibility? Of abs, abs, absolutely. I, you know, I, we, we had uh, yesterday uh, one of the, the folks from, uh, from the outskirts of town, actually, he's the head ER doc at St. Luke's, uh, talked about the phenomenon of synthetic drugs, and he's been working in ERs for over 20 years, and he says he's been through the, the rage of uh, the early goings of the crack cocaine and then following up with the meth. And he says that that the synthetic drugs is leaps and bounds worse than either of those two combined. It is a true healthcare problem that we have. Uh, and the thing is, is that we have these folks that come in for acute issues uh, that need to be hospitalized, uh, but we don't know long-term effects. That's my my true worry for the especially for these youth is what 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 are the long-term damages, especially with their brain uh, regarding these. This, this medication. We don't know. Now, the owner of Last Place on Earth, Jim Carlson, he, I mean, I was at the, at the hearings on Friday. I, we actually couldn't even get in and we got there a little bit early, but not early enough. I didn't see you there, mm -hmm. um, but there were other counselors. I think even the mayor was outside, you know, and there was, some, you know, uh, there were prominent people that could not even get into those hearings because of the overwhelming space. So yep. I say that for two reasons, because I know there was a big response, but also because Mr. Carlson was there and he he was um, very gracious and upfront in giving us an interview. And uh, I talked with him and he had a number of things to say. Um, mm -hmm. And but one of the things that he claims is that he feels that marijuana should be legalized and that he finds, and I'm, I'm not going to try and represent his views, I just want to try and paraphrase what I heard him saying. He feels that this effort is some kind of symbolic um, gesture. beachhead or gesture towards encouraging the legalization of you know, naturally grown mm -hmm. marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, how do you respond when you hear those arguments from him? You know, it, I think he's, he's avoiding the, the true issue. Uh, and that's that the synthetics uh, are truly, the, you can't even compare them to, to marijuana. Uh, right now they say the active ingredients uh, in, in the, the bath salts and potpourri are five times stronger than the active ingredient in, in marijuana. Uh, 
and the damage that they're doing is is immense. I, I truly have not uh, witnessed uh, folks uh, that have dependency on marijuana, uh, you know, doing the damage that they're that they're doing in their psychosis states, whether you know the, the cases have been shown in the last just in the last six months that some of the horrific things that have been done with folks that are high on synthetics, uh, extracting their own teeth with their hands or you know, stabbing themselves repeatedly, taking their eyeballs out. That stuff doesn't happen with marijuana. So uh, Mr. Carlson, while I you know, understand his argument on that, I, this is apples and oranges. This, this is the stuff that he's selling is, is permanently damaging our, our country and our city. And I, I don't respect that argument. And I don't think it should be part of the argument at all. Mm -hmm. All right, so the other thing that he talks about is that pharmaceutical companies and, phys and physicians and, and prescribers like yourself um, are making available things like Oxycontin, I think, is a drug that he mentioned by name, and I think Methadone is a drug that he mentioned by name. And he says these are also, what is the word, analog? I mean, they're, they're similar to other natural drugs like um, heroin, mm -hmm. well, heroin in mm -hmm. most cases. Opiate. Yeah. yeah, and so um, is that something that should also be outlawed? I, you know, and I can't, I can't say for everyone, but I know our clinic is taking a very strong look at, at opiates. Uh, uh, I think it's been a struggle not only for our clinic but nationwide on how these medications, how they work long-term effect. Um, it's just like anything that you take, whether it's alcohol, uh, tobacco, marijuana, so on and so forth. Uh, you grow a dependency, uh, you get a dependency on it uh, and, and a tolerance. And so these meds only work for so long until you need more and more. Uh, so I know that we're taking a very active approach at Manoyo and in care clinics, working with partnership with the Mayo Clinic on chronic pain and how to deal with it long term, where it doesn't have to take effect of being on opiates. Uh, but absolutely, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's something we're looking at, uh, and I think it's a change in medicine over the last 10 years that we've seen uh, that you know, these long-term patients on, on uh, opiates uh, isn't always the way it should be, that we need to work with them behavioral health-wise, we have to work with them um, with exercise, physiology, with eating right. Those type of things, where I think you get more response, more relief off of that. Uh, we're really starting to, uh, you know, we, we have the backing of uh, not only our uh, medical providers, but the tribe in itself, uh, tribal council. So it's, I think we're on to some really neat things in, in Indian country uh, regarding that. And we, we just have witnessed or seen in the paper what struggles of other uh, Indian communities uh, uh, in, over what's happening in Wisconsin uh, uh, with issues over there with substance abuse with opiates uh, at LCO. Uh, and, uh, what, what's happening at LCO? There was a, there was a big article in the paper uh, a month ago maybe or two months ago uh, just basically saying that the huge uh, issues with uh, opiate abuse on, in the LCO tribe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's affecting and law one, enforcement and government. Law enforcement, government, and one of the docs got actually got his uh, license taken away by the state. Uh, so you know, it's it's For allegedly over prescribing. Yeah, yeah. So it's this is home. This is only an hour and a half away. So uh, I'm very impressed by you know what it, what Fond du Lac is doing to, to step it up and 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 then help our folks uh, deal with chronic pain because it is a true thing, absolutely. Um, another interesting connection of Fond du Lac Band to the last place on earth is that we actually have a piece of land in Duluth that is, you know, a stone's throw from last place on earth. And, um, and you're again in a unique position where you are, I mean, you are, you're just a unique man. <laughs> you have, you have fingers, you know, or Joking. feet, you're planted either because of your whatever it is, you know, whether it's a spiritual thing or what, but I mean, you're, you're rooted in different, you know, communities. Yeah. And, um, 
are you hearing anything or seeing anything ab ab about how it's affecting that neighborhood around absolutely. Fond du Luz? It is. It absolutely is. It's affecting Fond du Luz and the casino. I know they have had to tighten security and, uh, in regards to that. And uh, it's, you know, it's down, it's, it's, it's the majority of the businesses in downtown Duluth. You know, public restrooms aren't open anymore throughout the city, even, you know, as far out as the, the main library has to close down some of their uh, facilities. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing problem, and they're, they're right at ground zero. So absolutely, they're, they're uh, uh, part of the, you know, we're looking in that, try to help them out. And, uh, <clears throat> just a couple weeks ago, our, uh, one of our very successful uh, uh, barber shops uh, uh, closed down, and the owner went on Facebook and totally blamed uh, Carlson for, for losing it. Uh, and uh, we've seen that uh, with a couple different businesses now in the last year. So we got, you know, since I started this job, we've had such a really, I don't think there's been a more impressive uh, uh, rebirth of Duluth from Lake Avenue. Did you say impressive? Impressive uh, growth of development from Lake Avenue to Vickers in the last five years. It's, uh, it's phenomenal, all the, all the things that are going on, uh, including the North Shore that's uh, still going through its development. But that one stickler we have right now is this last place on earth. And it's, it's, it's a true cancer uh, to our downtown businesses. Mm -hmm. I actually talked to Jim about the North Shore a little bit because I don't know if you knew this, but I actually managed the North Shore Did for you? about a year. And uh, I had a small, a small vending business that operated right in that area there. And at that time, a few years ago, um, we were visioning something like this, what you call this impressive rebirth and and we were, I mean, when I was at the North Shore, we had hundreds, maybe, I think we counted once, it was about 150 local and community arts events that we did just in about a year's time there, you know, which is small and big events and other mm -hmm. things. And at that time, um, Jim was involved in this group we called the Odd Shopkeepers, the old downtown shopkeepers, and he was and his, meeting his with dad. people and talking about how to increase business and how to deal with, you know, Vagrancy was an issue that came up with him and also with his dad at his mm -hmm. bookstore. He had, I guess, vagrancy is, is uh, a word that's used. You could, you know, it's hard to label people necessarily. Right. But, um, and so I actually asked him about that. I said, Do you still have that attitude? Because a lot of the, these business people hate you. <laughs> no. And uh, I didn't get a really conclusive answer from that. But is there anything good that's happening? I mean, he's paying taxes, he talks about that a lot. No, I, I, you know, I, I have no problem with him uh, running a shop uh, as it was before, but it, the synthetics have to go. There's, there's no doubt about it. I'm not here to shut down his shop permanently, anything like that. That's not my aspect or the goal of this. Uh, my aspect is that we, the, the synthetics are destroying our city, and uh, it's that, it's all that, or like to get rid of that or nothing. And uh, uh, you know what. What I really see in uh, what I just showed you is that you know when uh, our Attorney General Swanson came on Friday, I reason he didn't get into the to the the meeting, and I, I wish I would have been there, but of course you know I, I was working and uh -huh. uh, at care and uh, you know I had my patients a month out in advance. So uh, the reason I, I think she underestimated the problem. I think uh, you're, you're when you're a politician in that area, you're very sheltered in the Twin Cities. And I don't think she quite understood what was going on up here. When she saw the outpour of folks from all different walks of life, whether it's mothers dealing with their child that's been addicted or has got permanent issues now because of it, uh, big business owners, small business owners, uh, medical, uh, mental health, uh, you know, uh, people on the uh, juvenile side of things. Uh, it, that's the reason we weren't able to get in there is because it was, I think she was overwhelmed. And you can see right now what, what happened since Friday is her uh, staff brought these five ring binders that are filled. I probably got two weeks of reading through here of, of statutes. But I think what's happening now is this is going to be at the forefront of her agenda. And what the city of Duluth has struggled with and our attorneys is that we've had to take these cases on by ourselves. But I think now with, uh, with what she saw, I think we're going to start getting partnership with the state, uh, with their attorneys, 
and uh, I think it's also going to get to the federal level a little bit more once the state gets into it. So we needed that partnership. We couldn't be the only one uh, tackling this, and I think right now we're going to not only have the city, but the state, and then hopefully the feds soon. So I'm, I'm really optimistic about how we're going to move forward. Tell me, uh, describe in, uh, you know, and you don't need to read it for me necessarily, but describe the ordinance that you all passed yesterday. The ordinance we passed yesterday is just, uh, I, I think it's some more tools for especially enforcement or police to, to be able to, to counter with the synthetic abuse. Uh, it's not an overall uh, solver of the whole issue by no means, but it makes it more difficult to, to be able to, to sell this stuff. What, what does it do? It's a, it's a uh, so the, part of it is a licensure uh, where they have to go through uh, the same route as tobacco or, or uh, liquor uh, to, as far as getting a license. What this will do is it basically will prohibit anybody else from being able to get one. Carlson's uh, last place on earth will be grandfathered in, uh, but he has to set up a licensure uh, for it. Uh, another step is you got to be uh, over 18 to be able to buy it. We're looking at over age 21 and older to be able to buy it, much like alcohol, uh, which right now is not the case. You can be 18 and older yet. Uh, another step uh, regarding this is that uh, it makes it illegal for uh, anything that's labeled uh, not for human consumption, uh, to, uh, it makes it illegal to, to have it, and especially on the outside grounds. It's illegal right now to have a beer in your hand walking down. Uh, uh, and that's uh, uh, the same thing that we're trying to do. Right now you can walk down the street with a synthetic uh, marijuana smoking it, or bath salts. Uh, it's, it's legal to do that. So this uh, will set the same precedence as uh, alcohol. Um, and the third thing is, is that we want to have it where we, you have to get the active ingredients on the synthetic drugs uh, that the drug companies, uh, whoever's making these bath salts and synthetics, do not want. Uh, so, you know, that's the third option is that we're going to try to make a mandatory where they tell us what the active ingredients are. Do you think that there's a um, constitutional question there at all? I mean, the, the off-label use, I mean, if my... My daughter wants to dye her hair, and she wants to use Kool-Aid for the dye. I mean, it's not designed for that. I guess that's reverse order of human ingestion versus using it for some other external use. Yeah. But this is America. I mean, are people free to purchase something and then use it as they desire? So, so and you know, out of respect, I, I, I truly believe that's 99% of the circumstance. But uh, here, the synthetic... Uh, uh, pull breeze and bath salts are hiding behind it, so they can't get sued for a lawsuit uh, by putting that. So they're down. lying. That's yeah, absolutely, trickery. absolutely. Well, that's what they're doing, and they're 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 basically hiding behind guidelines of the federal uh, laws uh, prohibiting it. So they're they're putting that sticker on to cover their tails. Uh, they darn well know that people aren't using them for that. It's it was meant to be for uh, uh, smoking or ingesting, and. Uh, uh, I don't buy that at all. So 99% of the time, you're absolutely right that uh, these products are made uh, for what they're supposed to be, but these products, no. And they're just hiding behind the federal guidelines so they don't have to uh, to report back to the FDA and, and, and the feds. Um, back to this, one of the, what seems to some and to Jim Carlson to be a central issue of this. Mm -hmm. um, why not... I mean, this is a symbolic effort. There's likely to be challenges, court challenges, other Absolutely. things, um, which which could be costly for the city. Um, why not just legalize marijuana mm -hmm. and make that symbolic mm -hmm. statement? I, you know, I think there's a tide that, uh, if you look nationally, I think the West Coast is already starting to open up on that. Uh, California is is, is engaged uh, with it. Oregon, they're saying Oregon, off of state taxes, might make one billion dollars. To go back and sure. into funding on different yeah. things, uh, so uh, it's it's something that we'll have to look at in the future. You know, I think we we haven't been winning the drug war uh, in a lot of cases, and this might be a possibility of looking into it. Uh, marijuana has some really good uh, openings on the medical side too. If if you look at those folks, especially dealing with cancer, um, it all not only help, helps out with their pain, but it helps with appetite uh, to help them eat.
reports that similarly have held drug paraphernalia ordinances enacted by the cities of Hastings in 2010 and Red Wing, Minnesota in 2012. So there's a roadmap for what's done. Sorry about that. What are you doing? Here's a new drug paraphernalia in the 1990s, which appears to have expired, I think. One thing the city could look at considering doing is extending or adopting a drug paraphernalia ordinance, modeling it after a community like Moorhead that has withstood constitutional scrutiny. Again, a drug paraphernalia ordinance doesn't completely ban or shut down a business that sells synthetic drugs, but it does send a strong message to a head shop, both reputationally and economically, that such activity isn't accepted within a particular municipality. And then third, the third kind of area where the cities are acting is in the area of regulatory law or zoning law. Uh, for example, many cities around the country have zoning ordinances that require a head shop to be with a certain distance from other businesses, and I know Duluth right now is looking at doing that as well. You know, fourth, as for the state legislature, I think a city could, could uh, require uh, retailers who sell products that are potentially harmful to the public health to then be licensed by the city so that, again, what the government giveth, it can taketh away. The value of licensing is you can take away a license so that they can strip it if a merchant engages in sales that harm the public health. And then finally, as I mentioned, the legislature gave the Drug Abuse Agency and the Coordinating Council uh, some resources and legal authority to help develop statewide solutions to the drug abuse problem. And you know, I certainly uh, look forward to working with them and uh, would encourage the city and everybody here to work with both them and uh, the council and the select committee so that all of us together can develop and share ideas and develop ideas that foster solutions to this problem. I, I hope that this hearing can help facilitate such a dialogue as well and look forward to hearing uh, from the audience uh, here in a minute. Um, you know, I guess uh, with that, if, without objection, I just probably jump right in and have our first uh, person come up. And what I was gonna ask is if um, Lieutenant Brad Pennis from the Moorhead Police Department could come forward having driven five hours across the top of the state to be here. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to please take a seat. So, Lieutenant um, Pettis, I guess we're going to ask all witnesses to state your name, your organizational affiliation, and um, your address uh, for the record. We're making a record of the hearing today so that we have it available. Um, and as I understand it, Lieutenant Pettis, you were invited to be here by the uh, Chief of Police here in Duluth. So thank you for making that trip across the state to come and share your experience in Moorhead. Please, please proceed. Three, four, five, six. All right. Uh, I supervise our investigative division. I'm also commander of the River Valley uh, Drug Task Force. <laughs> Uh, in our area as well. So I guess I'm here today to talk about some of the issues and problems we face and had in the city of Moorhead. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll just begin. In 2011, we had five head shops operating in the city of Moorhead. And we were kind of faced with two separate issues. Um, the first one being the, the topic here today with uh, synthetic drugs. And the second one being the fact that all these head shops are not only selling synthetics, but they're selling drug paraphernalia as well. Um, we you know, realized that there was a, a concern with uh, Minnesota laws uh, compared to North Dakota laws, us being a border community. Um, most of these head shops set up uh, within a few blocks, uh, in a downtown area within a few blocks of the city of Fargo. The state of North Dakota and the city of Fargo took a pretty uh, uh, aggressive approach and stance against both paraphernalia and synthetics. So it was very easy and convenient for uh, the state next door to have uh, their citizens travel into our community and obtain these products. So. Um, so we started looking into it and uh, realized in about 2009 we were seeing a problem with uh, synthetic uh, marijuana or synthetic drugs and uh, after the successful legislation uh, passed and the law came into effect in uh, July 1st, uh, 2011, we soon found that uh, um, it, it didn't you know, cure the problem, so to speak, and we still needed to take kind of an aggressive approach. Uh, we had all kinds of problems with synthetics. We were seeing all kinds of issues. We had armed robberies at our head shops. Um, create some public concerns. We had smash and grab burglaries where people were stealing synthetics. We had a uh, middle school child being expelled from school for bringing synthetics there. We had high school kids becoming sick and requiring medical treatment. We had an individual jump through a uh, glass window on a second floor building, uh, severely injuring himself. Uh, so we had all kinds of problems like that that we needed to kind of go after and combat. And like you mentioned earlier, 
um, you know, it's just a lot of challenges and, and uh, you know, they will uh, they sell the stuff as uh, room deodorizers and things like that, incense, and, and you know, that's, that's not the issue and that's not the concern there. They, they sell them as flavored, making them uh, um, a, a kind of a choice for children, uh, things like that. Uh, and I guess what we, the approach we took when the law went in effect in Jan or, uh, July of 2011, we went out and we met with uh, each individual head shop owner. We provided them a copy of the new law. We sent, we provided them a letter indicating the, uh, you know, how the law works, the approach we were going to take, and what we we're going to do about that. And at that point in time, all five of our head shops were in compliance, and nobody was uh, had product on the shelf. Within five days of that, we found out that they're still selling synthetics. Uh, so we went in and made a couple of purchases. We purchased a product from two separate head shops. We sent it to the lab, and the BCA lab did a remarkable job. Great turnaround, got his results back, realized that both of these uh, are two of the businesses that we purchased from are selling products that were legal uh, uh, by the new state uh, statute that went into effect. So in one of the situations, we ended up doing a search warrant. Uh, we seized over 2,000 packages of product. And uh, in the other situation, we just basically did a law informed complaint. We charged both business owners. And uh, what we found out is that there were still challenges. And uh, both of those cases, and uh, in, in both of those cases, neither one of them were successfully prosecuted. This is a, it's a very challenging uh, uh, issue when it comes to the, the legal aspect of it. And uh, the results, I guess, were not what we were looking for. One of the cases ended up uh, being dismissed for the lack of uh, getting an expert witness to come in and testify about the chemicals and the analogs and so forth. Uh, the second case resulted in a hung jury, which uh, um, eventually, I guess, that case was uh, a pled away, so to speak. Um, so again, what we did at that point in time is realize we had to take a different approach and we went after the drug paraphernalia ordinance. It uh, mirrored the Uniform Controlled Substance Act. We were able to receive successful um, results from our city council. They passed that uh, later in November. The law, uh, the city ordinance uh, went into effect uh, January 2012. However, prior to that, what we did is we held an informational meeting with all the head shops, our county attorney's office, we told them what uh, we were looking at. We told them what uh, products were uh, deemed to be illegal and products that uh, we thought should be removed from the shelves that would be illegal according to our city ordinance. After we did that uh, and the law went into, or uh, the city ordinance was passed, we also went into each individual head shop and we met with them and looked at their product, provided them a copy of the city ordinance, answered any questions, talked to them about how we were going to enforce it, um, and so forth. And um, one of those head shops, eventually, you talked about it earlier, they challenged it in federal court. Yeah. That was upheld and we're good to go there uh, today, right now. Um, so I, I guess um, three head shops remain open in our city right now for business. Two of them uh, closed their doors. We are still receiving voluntary compliance right now. Uh, but I'd like to know, you know, one of the owners of the, of the head shops in Moorhead was running a shop in Western North Dakota and uh, he was still selling synthetics. He was charged. Uh, he and uh, several employees in charge of that case is going through the uh, Burley County State's Attorney's Office. So, you know, that could have easily been us. Uh, we were a little bit more fortunate than they were. We're still receiving voluntary compliance. And I guess one of the main things I wanted to talk about and, and, and I guess get at here is that, you know, this isn't just a local or regional problem. You mentioned that earlier. This is a, this is a much larger problem. We know synthetics are in our community. We know that they're out there. We are receiving voluntary compliance right now. But uh, that, that case in North Dakota could easily have been us. And we, you know, so there are still issues, still problems. And I guess what I'm here to say is that we need to work together on this uh, and uh, try to come up with the, the best way to combat it. Yeah, uh, basically what we went and talked about uh, is, is certain products and certain items that, that we felt were used uh, exclusively for, um, to be used with uh, illegal drugs, such as, you know, in, in law enforcement, I guess we call them uh, dugouts or, uh, you know, things like that, but glass pipes that are used uh, to smoke uh, methamphetamine, um, crack cocaine, things like that, those are, and they had several hundred of these products on their shelves. Um, there are certain things that obviously weren't an issue or concern. You know, they can still sell tobacco, still sell rolling paper, traditional pipes, uh, hookahs, things like that. But, but what, what we were concerned about is a certain product that is, that is used, in our opinion, exclusively uh, for controlled substances. And those are some of the things that we talked about, and those are some of the things that we asked for voluntary compliance on. And again, that's what we did receive. Mm -hmm. And Lieutenant, have you found that um, the drug paraphernalia, these items that are banned, that are really used only to take illicit drugs, that that's a, a profit center for some of these 
smoke shops or head shops, that's a, one of the areas they can make money. And so if you pay on that, it helps curb the activity as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and again, our close proximity to North Dakota, we were getting yeah. complaints from Fargo law enforcement, from uh, North Dakota probation. Their clients were, you know, tripping across the river, uh, making it easy, uh, accessible to come and get these products. There's always the argument out there that, well, you can order them from the internet, you can get them anywhere. But that takes time, that takes a few days. You have to have a credit card, you have to be able to obtain that. And it's just that easy and accessibility on our side of the river uh, made it easy for them to come across and obtain the products. Okay. So I, I take it you think then, based on your success with the Moorhead Ordinance, that it's something you'd recommend other cities look at doing, Duluth or the other cities I mentioned that are having a problem with uh, these types of drug paraphernalia. You think an ordinance like that makes sense? It did. It worked for us. Yeah. I would recommend it. Again, you talked about the federal ruling. Uh, that went in yeah, our favor. So did. I would definitely recommend it. Okay. Thanks. Do any of you guys have any questions? Yeah. Uh, Representative Ward. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned several times voluntary compliance, voluntary compliance, voluntary compliance. So, two questions. What if you didn't have voluntary compliance, what would happen? Secondly, how, you know, um, uh, how did you get into voluntary compliance? We were, you know, I can't really answer on behalf of them. That's a decision they chose to do. Uh, they went that route, and if they didn't go that route, obviously we would be issuing citations. We would probably be in a courtroom battling the battling the charge. You know, but I guess I can't answer that because it, it worked out in our favor at this point in time. But again, one of those owners in our city uh, chose to go a different route in Western North Dakota, so he's facing charges out there. You know, I'm not an attorney, but uh, I, I think uh, I think we would have been. That's I think my so opinion. too. <laughs> yeah, you know, the neat thing about the Moorhead ordinance is they quickly sued a number of uh, companies sued, and it went in federal court before Judge Davis here in the federal system. And he has a published court decision of holding the constitutionality. They said, "Oh, it's too broad. It's unduly vague. You're not specifically defining the conduct that's banned. Therefore, it violates due process." But Judge Davis said, "No, it doesn't, based upon a U.S. Supreme Court ruling." So, I think he would have been. <laughs> would be my sense too. Uh, Representative Sean. Well, it's, you know, that seems to be the problem. That was the problem we faced with the two, you know, uh, places that we did charge out. Um, the, the fact that these people change the product, they change the chemicals, they're changing the substance continually. The fact that we would need expert witnesses to come in and discuss and talk about the products. Those are, those are our obstacles. How we can get over that challenge or get over that hump, I don't have the answer right now. That's why I, I guess I'm hoping uh, other people can step up that uh, have a little bit more background in, in the law, I guess. Okay. Any other questions from the legislative delegation? Okay, well, Lieutenant, again, thank you for making the trip all the way here. We really appreciate your testimony. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, for having thank you sir. Um, thank you. Okay. Our next witness then will be Special Agent Brian Marquardt, who, as I mentioned, is a statewide coordinator of the Violent Crime Coordinating Council within the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, where he uh, oversees the regional drug strike forces as well. Um, Special Agent Marquardt, if you can identify yourself uh, by name and spell your name and uh, organization, please. Brian Marquardt, M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-T. Um, I am currently the uh, acting uh, drug and gang coordinator with the Department of Public Safety. Great. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me um, on behalf of uh, all the narcotics investigators in the state of Minnesota. Um, this is a very um, important topic that we need to have discussions. There is frustration in all of law enforcement uh, about how to, how to go after this. Um, I also provide staff support to the Violent Crime Coordinating Council, uh, and they provide oversight to the 23 funded uh, drug task forces in the state. Um, they cover 63 of the counties and a large number of the city municipalities throughout the state. Uh, task forces use both state and federal money um, and through joint powers agreements, try to combine efforts uh, regionally uh, to com combat the problem and then cooperate between the task forces uh, to go after the tasks, in including this one. 
Uh, in 2012, the task force has conducted over 7,000 active investigations with 3,900 arrests. Uh, they collectively seized thousands of grams of heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, marijuana, and synthetics. In 2010 and 2011, the task forces began to see synthetic products becoming increasingly popular. Um, they were being sold uh, mostly to teens and young adults. These products were sold in retail outlets, pet shops, and also over the internet. These products uh, were having serious side effects for the users, and there was an increased number of reports from poison control centers, hospitals, and law enforcement regarding these products and their activities. Over this past year, we've seen a significant increase in the quantity and purity of heroin, an increase in unlawful sales and use of prescription drugs, as well as a dramatic increase, which I'll uh, describe to you, in the use and sale of synthetic drugs, which include synthetic caffeinones, bath salts, uh, synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic marijuana, and other products which are being sold in local tobacco and head shops. It's disturbing to me the number of juveniles who believe that these products are not harmful. In a 2012 study from the University of Maryland, synthetic cannabinoids was the third most reported substance abused by U.S. high school students in grades 9 through 12. The Minnesota Student Survey has also added that question for this following year, uh, so we will have data at the beginning of next year. In 2012, the Office of Justice Programs began collecting data on synthetic substances encountered by the drug task forces. The drug task force has reported 5,010 grams of synthetics purchased or seized in all of 2012. Over half of the 23 drug task forces in the state reported conducting investigations involving those products. In the first quarter of 2013, task forces reported a significant increase in synthetic cases as a result of a number of collaborative investigations. Reported seizure amounts jumped to over uh, 52,000 grams which is over 116 pounds of the product, and which is 10 times higher than for all of 2012. And this was only for the first quarter of 13. Three gram packages typically sell for 15 to 20 dollars in these shops. Uh, one recent investigation that occurred in the second quarter of 2013, so it's not reported yet, led to the seizure of over 130,000 grams of packaged synthetics, uh, 45,000 prepackaged. Uh, ready for sale uh, and a lab capable of producing several hundred thousand grams. We anticipate the total seizures for 2013 could be well over 500,000 grams with a street value in excess of three million dollars. Coordination between the task forces and other state and federal agencies continues to attempt to identify, disrupt, and dismantle any of these organizations or places that are selling these controlled substances or synthetics. Although some of the synthetics are purchased over the internet, a vast majority of these uh, coordinated investigation efforts occur in small areas that have retail head shops. The task forces face a multitude of challenges in regards to these. The increased lab analysis required to determine if it is covered under a current law. Um, recently through this legislature, uh, two drug chemists were assigned to the BCA uh, to help cover that backlog and also the increase in synthetics that are coming through. Uh, the difficulty in state and federal legislation, obviously, to keep up as the chemicals change and as fast as they uh, change the chemical composition to skirt the current laws. Um, the difficulty in county attorneys having to pursue charges under the analog statute, things that aren't familiar with them, the cost associated with having to bring in experts uh, to talk about how the analog statute does fit. The bizarre and unpredictable behavior exhibited by the users of these products, which plague these communities and threaten public safety and also the seller's portrayal that these substances are legal uh, and or not harmful. Uh, the Office of Justice Programs has provided training on synthetic products for law enforcement over the past year, including the last two narcotics conferences held in the state. Task Force personnel have conducted 470 presentations in 2012 to more than 15,000 citizen community groups, law enforcement, and other government entities on narcotics-related topics, including synthetics. Our goal is to educate the public on the dangers associated with the synthetic products and to use all of our law enforcement resources to stop these extremely dangerous products from getting into our communities. On behalf of the narcotics investigators in the state of Minnesota, we're pleased uh, and, and glad to be here at this hearing, uh, given the opportunity to speak, uh, and we will continue to investigate and arrest those who sell synthetic drugs, 
and look forward to partnering with prosecutors, experts, uh, and all law enforcement to try to combat this problem. Well, thank you very much, Agent, for that and for your work in this area as well. Um, you mentioned uh, public education and public awareness. I think of methamphetamine. You know, when methamphetamine first started uh, becoming a big thing, there were some kids and young people who took it who people would say, well, that kid wasn't a kid who took drugs, uh, but for some reason they felt it was safe. And, and then some of the dangers started coming out and some of the horrors that happened with that drug. And then there, that helped, I think, in terms of curbing it. Uh, are you seeing the same thing here as well, that there's a need uh, to, for public education, awareness, uh, getting the dangers of this stuff out there to kids who might not be the type of kid who would otherwise take drugs? Absolutely. Yeah. And the good thing with this state is we we, we yeah. didn't already go through it, so yeah. we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Um, we can just uh, add that substance and, and tool it uh, to train and, and get the education component out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. How about uh, legislators? Any questions for Special Agent? Okay, well, thank you for your work and for your service. Um, we'll call up our next uh, witness here. Yep. Um, and before I do that, I want to make two more introductions. I saw Lieutenant Governor Yvonne Kretner Solon come in the room, and thank you so much for uh, being here as well, Lieutenant Governor. I really appreciate that. Uh, and then also your County Attorney, uh, Mark Rubin, I want to make sure to recognize him and his presence here. Uh, you have a County Attorney who is a phenomenal prosecutor and has a great statewide reputation for tough and effective prosecution of crime, and his really reputation second to none among prosecutors in the state. So thank you for being here too. Um, next witness here, we'll just have two more quick uh, witnesses just to give a feel for what is being done right now at the state level and then we'll start going through the list of others as well from uh, Duluth who've signed up here. Um, and that is uh, Cody Weiberg who's the Executive Director of the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, Mr. Weiberg, just spell your name for the court reporter and your state your organization for the record. Yes, uh, first thank you for being here. I'm Dr. Cody Weiberg, that's C-O-D-Y-W-I-B-E-R-G. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy. And uh, just to talk briefly about the Board of Pharmacy's role. The Board of Pharmacy is actually a very old state agency whose primary function is to regulate the practice of pharmacy and the distribution of legal drugs in the state. So it might seem a little bit strange that we're uh, involved as we are in the issue of synthetic drugs. But uh, back in the 70s, when most states were passing a version of the Uniform Controlled Substance Act, the legislature uh, gave the authority to the Board of Pharmacy to when the legislature is not in session, uh, add drugs or remove drugs or switch drugs around in the controlled substance schedules. And we've been uh, doing that ever since. Uh, we first, I'm gonna give a little bit of history of, of the synthetic drugs in particular. We, have, we first became aware of synthetic drugs back in the middle of 2010 from an unusual source. Before then, normally, when we would hear about new street drugs, uh, we would hear about it from law enforcement agencies and county prosecutors. In this case, we heard about it from a Fargo reporter who had mentioned that the North Dakota Board of Pharmacy had just passed emergency rules regarding synthetic cannabinoids, asked if we were doing the same. Told the reporter this is the first we'd heard about it, that we in fact didn't have at that time any emergency rulemaking authority, and that we'd take a look into it. What the board did, or what I did, is actually do the research, found out uh, about these synthetic cannabinoids, determined that they are in fact incredibly dangerous products, uh, received permission from the board to begin the rulemaking process. We started that in 2010. Uh, in Minnesota, the rulemaking process is quite uh, lengthy and complex. Um, one of the things that uh, can happen in Minnesota that is very rare, I'm, I'm told, in, among the states, is that if, you, if as few as 25 people request it, you have to have a rules hearing before an administrative law judge. We had over one, 100 requests for rulemaking uh, they were almost all of them, obviously, from a, a, uh, a organized attempt. They all use the same language, right down to the misspelling of my last name. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we determined late in November of 2010 that we would have to have a rulemaking hearing. By that time, legislators in both parties were already expressing interest in pursuing legislation. The board withdrew the rules and we worked with the legislature. In 2010, what we did, is uh, we provided the legislature with uh, a list of the uh, mostly at that point synthetic cannabinoids, a few of the synth synthetic uh, stimulants and hallucinogens uh, that were we were being told about by law enforcement bureau of criminal apprehension. Uh, we also I also recommended that the legislature pass the analog language, and we drafted that. Actually, ran it past the attorney general's office, 
uh, because I'm not an attorney and I wasn't sure if it would pass constitutional muster. <coughs> Um, and uh, we did uh, we did uh, work with the legislature to get that passed in 2010. As uh, previous testifiers have already mentioned, uh, we were told after that language was passed that prosecutors were having difficulty with it. They didn't have a lot of difficulty getting an expert to show that the drug was chemically similar to a controlled uh, substance. They did have trouble getting someone to say that it acted on the brain in the same way. So what we did in 2011 to try to address this again, did more research, found an approach that was first used in the United Kingdom and then in North Dakota and Kansas and some other states. So currently, uh, and this language passed in uh, 2012, uh, the synth there are uh, eight uh, categories of synthetic cannabinoids listed. The last is a miscellaneous category. The first seven are distinct chemical categories. And now, at least for the synthetic cannabinoids, and a few of the stimulants, we, we did the same thing. Uh, if something is chemically in one of those categories and manipulated in certain ways, it's automatically a controlled substance and there's no need to prove that it's pharmacologically act in the same way on the brain. Uh, the other thing that, even though we're not law enforcement, one of the things that I recommended in both 2011 and 2012, and it, it happened in 2012, was to put the penalty for the sale of synthetic cannabinoids at the felony level. And the reason I did this is, again, not, we're not law enforcement. It's because we do, we are pharmacists, and we have extensive training in chemistry and pharmacology, biology, neuroanatomy, and physiology. And in my estimation then and today, uh, these substances are far more dangerous than regular marijuana. Um, much, much more dangerous. And, and, and I always thought the penalty ought to be uh, more than that. Uh, the final thing that we did in, in 2012, uh, you already mentioned, the board got expedited rulemaking authority. Um, that does expire in 2014. Uh, what we do has to be ratified. Uh, this year, uh, not as much work, but what we did, again, uh, receiving information from law enforcement, prosecutors around the state, and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, uh, we've added another, uh, we worked with the legislature, I should say, to add another seven drugs to the controlled substance schedules, six cannabinoids and a hallucinogen. So that's, uh, that's what we've done to this point and uh, uh, we take part in the state uh, 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 substance abuse strategy uh, and uh, we're willing to, to work with your office, with the legislature, with the other agencies. We already get calls all the time from law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, encourage them to call us and uh, we'll, we'll do the part that we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Reiner. It's nice to see you up here in Duluth. Um, I just want to come back and, and visit the rulemaking issue. Uh, as you know, that was my bill and Senator Newman's bill uh, in the Senate. And as I recall, um, this issue of rulemaking it almost brought the bill down. And you know, if we could just touch for a minute, it, you know, it, it was also my clear recollection that this was perhaps the most important thing we could do for you and your agency in terms of trying to have a, a, an organization that operates year round, unlike the part-time Minnesota legislature, to stay on top of the nimbleness of the, you know, the, the changing compounds and the changing formulas. So it ending in 2014 and the legislature needing to ratify every decision you make is concerning to me but I distinctly recall it being necessary in order to find a compromise and move that, that bill out of conference committee and back to the House and Senate. So maybe if you could just take a couple uh, minutes to talk about why that's important and what you would hope the legislature would do in, in uh, uh, 2014, 2013, yeah, 2014, thanks. That, that is correct, it was a contentious issue and it did almost bring the bill down. Um, the, uh, uh, we, uh, there's a couple things. Uh, I, I think at a minimum, we would appreciate that uh, the rulemaking authority be made permanent so we don't have to come back and, and get it passed each time. Um, in terms of uh, the other provision that it needs to be ratified, uh, I, I think that um, that is, is, is another thing that I think probably should go away. And the reason I would say that is we already have regular rulemaking authority that's quite broad that goes far beyond uh, this area. Uh, and uh, you know those rules don't expire after a certain amount of time, and I, I'm not sure why this would be any different. Uh, now there is one thing uh, the legislature passed uh, back in 
I'm not quite sure what year, 2010-2009, uh, former Representative Carla Bigham uh, wanted to make sure that uh, the schedules that were found in statute corresponded with the ones that were found in rule. So one of the things that the board has now been doing the last couple years anyway is in December we do issue a report to the legislature about anything uh, that we uh, have done in rule concerning controlled substances. The intent there was uh, to then have the legislature go in and put this in statute. Uh, so we're doing that anyway, but the problem with, with needing it ratified uh, is if uh, anything goes wrong, and, and you all know how this can happen. Uh, it gets towards the end of the session, and some bills don't get up, um, and if we have a bill that doesn't get up, then it's gone. Uh, and so uh, I think it, I think it would be a good idea really to, to remove both of those provisions or to, to give us the permanent authority and remove the necessity to have it ratified. Any other questions? Um, Representative Ward. Just a question comment. Uh, I want to go back to, uh, to, go back to Agent uh, Marquardt who talked about the need for education of, of this issue. And, um, and uh, Attorney General Swanson, you also addressed yeah. that as well. Yeah. And in our in our public safety committee, uh, Representative Slavic or um, Sh Shannon Slavic, Representative Slavic, talked in our in our public safety committee about um, I think it was a, another state, a Utah or somebody, Idaho, Idaho that uh, had an education component that had some, uh, had put it in place and made a huge impact. Um, on uh, uh, synthetics and meth and things like that, as far as the decline, uh, you know, in the sale and everything else of of, of that kind of uh, issue, and so uh, you know, again, we in, we on the public safety committee um, talked uh, at length about that as well. So we, you know, we that is that is an aspect that um, that we need to really do look at. The second thing I want to do to address was uh, Dr. Weiberg is is um, you know, like we did with meth, like we did with meth. Um, uh, you know, at one point in time we. Uh, um, took Sudafed and made Sudafed um, behind the counter rather than in front of the counter, right? right? And that made a significant impact at that point uh, with the. Uh, and I know that we know that uh, with these synthetics, they're just using different chemicals all the time. Is, are there similar chemicals? Are there? Are there? Is is there a way to, you know, label some of those um, uh, chemicals that they might be using uh, regularly? And do similar to what we did with uh, Sudafed, and make an impact that way as well. I'm not a chemist, and you are, so you talk to us about that. <laughs> not a chemist, but I have a lot of chemistry training. Uh, okay. Probably not, uh, not quite the way that we did with methamphetamine. Uh, with methamphetamine, uh, pseudoephedrine is a commonly used product, a nasal de decongestant, actually FDA approved, readily available. Um, some of the chemicals that are used in the production of these drugs are, are some, some of them are pretty basic chemicals that you really can't really ban or regulate too, too much. The, the other issue is that I'm not quite sure that you have a lot of local production necessarily in Minnesota. Uh, some of this stuff is being manufactured over the seas, overseas and shipped in in other parts of the country. So I'm not quite sure that that's uh, the way to go uh, either. Um, uh, but, you know, while you were talking, um, I thought you might be going a different way with this, so I did want to make one comment I didn't make before, and that's some of the other ideas that are in the Attorney General's report. Um, I do think that uh, having cease and desist authority mm -hmm. would be useful for the board, mm -hmm. and I don't really want to discuss this idea too much because I've, I've had an idea I've been mulling for a while, and I just talked to some of the Attorney Generals just two days ago about this concept, but the board has some current authority that it's never used uh, in this sort of a situation that might tie in with cease and desist, and I want to talk with the Attorney General's office about it, but this might allow us to very quickly get stuff off of store shelves, um, even before we ban it. So, but I need to talk more yeah, about it. Ms. Dr. Weiberg, I would love to work with you on that as well, uh, both in terms of your ideas and also the cease and desist authority and with the legislature too. I think there may be some things that could be done there which would be helpful. Any other legislative questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Weiberg. And then um, Mr. Hartford. <coughs> It's 
state and spell your name and the organization you represent for the record. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Dave Hartford, I am the DHS Assistant, H-A-R-T, F-O-R-D. I am the uh, DHS Assistant Commissioner for <coughs> Chemical and Mental Health Services. And part of, it, part of that administration is the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, as you stated earlier, that's a single state authority um, yeah, in the state of Minnesota that. for uh, substance abuse. Their job is to shape, develop, evaluate our policy, service, service delivery, and financing. Mm -hmm. uh, that group manages uh, about $134 million in our substance, consolidated substance abuse uh, fund and also about $80 million from our federal block grant. Uh, one of the very important features that that group also does is provide technical assistance statewide and uh, I believe we'll hear earlier or later on in our uh, event here, Laura Bennett, who is our regional um, mm -hmm. prevention coordinator that we'll hear some of the uh, local details uh, on our prevention efforts. Um, as you mentioned earlier, inside everyone's packet is a uh, statewide substance abuse strategy. And that document really came forward. Uh, the recognition over time, uh, not only of the importance of, of substance abuse issues within the state of Minnesota, but also the fact that many state agencies uh, were working independently trying to address these issues. And this was the first time uh, the, we came together uh, to put together a comprehensive framework for action across multiple agencies. Uh, the plan was released by Commissioner Jessen last fall with eight other agencies. And I'll kind of restate those for, uh, uh, for the audience here. Uh, not only the Department of Human Services, but also the Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. Education, Health, Public Safety, the State Judicial Board, Military Affairs, the Minnesota National Guard, and the Minnesota Board, Board of Pharmacy. This, the first of its kind in the country for this many multiple agencies to join together. For those of us that have worked in the area of substance abuse, prevention and treatment, this is a very big deal to have these agencies come together around these issues. Uh, this is a comprehensive approach that considers the cost of substance abuse and dollars, lost productivity, health, and lives lost. Uh, the group has been working, uh, uh, has been very active since uh, the launch last September, and there are a number of standing committees that have been uh, working diligently uh, one of the issues that came, as you'll see in the document, our growing opioid issue in Minnesota, both around heroin and uh, uh, prescription pain, painkillers, uh, was really a number one priority. There's been a great deal of activity around that. A uh, number of legislative pieces came forward to strengthen our uh, regulatory, uh, our regulations around um, methadone maintenance clinics. Uh, and a number of other other pieces. In fact, this month, during the month of June, uh, Minnesota TPT will be broadcasting uh, many times a uh, film that we have produced with them called Heroin at Home. Uh, and there will be a live event on June 18th with Commissioner Jessen and a live town hall discussing those issues. Uh, also, standing committees, we have a screening uh, committee that's addressing screening and what's referred to as uh, expert screening and brief intervention that's being moved to primary care across the state. Uh, specialty courts, uh, we're looking at an increase in drug courts. Uh, drug task forces, data and measurement, prevention, and prevention messaging are all part of the uh, subgroups that are now taking place within that organization. Uh, now to the local problem, or the, the problem uh, state nationally actually around um, synthetic drugs. One of the big concerns is really around as we looked at emergency department numbers uh, of quite concern is that children ages 12 to 18 
overly represented in that in the usage of these drugs. And in Minnesota, as we looked at the Hennepin Poison Center data, uh, we really take emergency room data from across the state. And in 2009, there were no reports. In 2009, Hennepin County Poison Control took 34 reports. And in two, 2011, 293 reports. And so as you look at that kind of increase. So with that, uh, we will we are looking today at how can we um, plan for additional prevention dollars in this area, along with with in our statewide substance abuse strategy. How can we pull together uh, additional planning? Um, with the data that we're obtaining on this synthetic problem and develop some additional plans out of the statewide uh, substance abuse uh, work groups. Okay, well thank you for um, your testimony. I know the report uh, that culminated in this uh, project, uh, you had hearings around the state and I think you had a hearing here in Duluth and is that going to be kind of an ongoing process? I mean this is a work in process or you'll continue to shape it and develop it as new problems come forward then? We're looking at an annual report sure. coming forward along with uh, more meetings around the state to continue to uh, collect data, local data, and to uh, what are the accomplishments uh, within the, on the strategy. Okay. Any questions here? Representative Huntley. Uh, I, you know, we're, we're talking about the, the details of this. We also have to convince the public of what the problem is. And maybe we'll hear later today, but uh, I've talked to a number of doctors in my community that have to treat these kids. And, and they're shocked and appalled at the permanent damage that this is causing to these young people. And I do think that when we try to push this to the public, uh, that their testimony, obviously they can't identify their particular patients, but uh, just we get some docs in here to talk about what what these kids look like. And uh, alcohol and drug abuse division certainly agrees with that, and that's as we're completing our federal block grant around prevention, we're looking at what can be done uh, specifically around prevention messaging on this issue. And we're going to have. Um I know we have an emergency room doctor who's going to testify in, in a minute here, and uh, several healthcare professionals as well who are going to be up. So, um, Lieutenant Governor Solon. Well, actually, I'm going to pass as long as you have an emergency room physician okay. coming in. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. And I'll wait until that time. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. So now, um, I think we proceed to the part here of our panel um, where we just start calling up and having come forward folks who signed up. We'll start with the people who signed up in advance. Uh, with our office to speak today. Um, I think there are about 25 people there, and then when that's done, I'll take a show of hands for anybody who didn't get the opportunity to sign up in advance but still wants to speak. I thought we would not put a time limit on uh, how long people speak, kind of ask you to be respectful that there's so many people here and kind of follow the honor code, if you will, so that we can uh, get as many people as possible in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can stay here uh, tonight as long as it takes for everybody who wants to talk to come forward. Uh, so. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask Lynn Habiger to come forward. Um, <coughs> Is that okay? <laughs> All right. They misspelled mine too, though. <laughs> it's a little complicated, so we'll definitely need you to state your name and spell it for the court reporter. My name is Lynn Habiger. The last name is spelled H-A-B-H-E-G-G-E-R. And I'm not here representing any official organization other than the American family. And Lynn, I want to thank you for coming forward. I know you have a courageous personal story that you're about to share with <laughs> I'm us. I'm obviously going to be your We brought the Kleenex. And, <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, you're very courageous to come forward and tell what's a very painful story for you and your family. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Attorney General Swanson, legislators, committee members, special guests, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today. And thank you for lending your support and that of your offices to this critical issue. My purpose of requesting to speak to you today is twofold. 
first to offer my assistance and support in any way possible to the efforts of this committee in the battle against synthetic drugs. And secondly, it's to share our family's story on how synthetic drugs have impacted our lives and in an effort to increase public awareness regarding the cost and the dangers of these substances. <clears throat> my family's future was forever altered when my 24-year-old son purchased and ingested a packet of synthetic drug commonly referred to as bath salts, purchased here in Duluth at a, from a local proprietor in June 2011. He was found by police at a local, local motel wandering the halls in a psychotic state, having just suffered a heart attack in the solitude of his hotel room. Upon arriving at the hospital, he was found to be in complete renal failure and was suffering from rhabdomyolosis, a, gener a degeneration of his muscle tissue, and was experiencing extreme psychosis requiring the use of physical and chemical restraints. Doctors informed me that had he not been found by police, he would have certainly died within a mere two hours. For 10 days, the doctors and nurses tended to my son in the hospital's intensive care unit, and by the grace of God, they were able to save his life. The cost of the bath salts, about $30. Fast forward two years to just this week. Three days ago, my family sat before a judge in a hospital conference room, and with the help of the county attorney's office, petitioned for the commitment of our son to a mental health facility against his will. You see, while my son's life was saved by the medical staff at the hospital two years ago, his mind was forever lost. The psychosis brought on by the synthetic drugs never dissipated, but has only grown worse over time. His synthetic drug-induced psychosis is of such a nature that he is now a threat to his own life, having attempted suicide multiple times since then, and to the safety of others. The family made the excruciating decision to have him committed in an effort to once again save his life and get him access to the mental health care he so desperately needs. Again, the cost of bath salts, about $30. And the cost of my son losing his sanity and his peace of mind, more than I can bear. But what about the cost to you, to society, the economy, and to the taxpayer? In this one case alone, community resources that have been expended to counteract a $30 packet of bath salts exceed hundreds of thousands of dollars. In medical expenses, police rescue and legal services, social services, county public health services, human services, state services, and mental rehabilitation services. And the list goes on and on. We all bear the cost of these horrific substances, whether it be physically, emotionally, socially, financially, or economically. As an 18-year Navy veteran, upon each enlistment, I raised my right hand and swore to defend our country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Make no mistake about it, the individuals who create these synthetic compounds, market, distribute, and sell them are, in my opinion, domestic enemies. Terrorists with no moral compass, in my opinion, using a type of chemical warfare on our own citizens, not for any type of seemingly altruistic motive, but for nothing more than financial gain. My family, and those of thousands of other Americans have been terrorized by synthetic drugs. It's time we fight back, enact laws that are tough and punishable, that are broad reaching, and are one step ahead of the people who create these drugs, rather than the opposite being true. I've enlisted in this fight, and I urge members of this community, the state, and the country to do the same. Consider what the cost could be to your bank. Thank you. Ms. Haberger, thank you so much for being here and thank you for so much for More than happy to help. telling your story. I know it's not easy and what you've gone through and your family and all of us, are, her hearts are with you. Thank you. Her hearts are with you. Um, you know, when we spoke, we as well talked about um, the need for public awareness too and I know that's one reason you're here 
is for that public awareness to help other families too. Absolutely. Could, could you comment on that? I, I think it's drastically important um, to increase the public awareness. Yeah. I'm very much out of my element no. here <laughs> no. in, in an attempt to do just that. Yeah. Um, our school children, the younger and younger that are happy, I've seen the ravages of yeah. these substances firsthand. I've watched my son near death. Um, he took them because at the time they were legal. Something legal obviously can't hurt you. That's the general public consensus and opinion. How far from the truth that is, and we have to get that message out there to people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very, very, very much and for your courage. Any questions uh, from over here? Well, thank you so much. Good, good luck to thank you, you and your family. Thank you. Our uh, next witness will be Dr. Nick Van Dielen from the St. Luke's Hospital Emergency Department. And I believe there may be some others who, if you have colleagues who wish to join you at the table as well. So, thank you so much. We'll get a couple chairs in here. Thank you. Okay, if you could um, all identify yourselves and spell your names uh, for the record and state your hospital organization. Uh, Nick Van Dielen, that's V A N D E E L E N. Uh, I'm an emergency physician, medical director at St. Luke's. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm Scott Wolf, W O L F F. Um, also emergency physicians at, at St. Luke's. Mm -hmm. And I'm Amory Robinson, first name A-M-E-R-Y, last name R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N, also an emergency physician at St. Luke's. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Please proceed. <coughs> Attorney General, uh, legislators and other guests, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to hold this public hearing. Uh, the problem of synthetic drug abuse is not unique to the Duluth community, and we've heard that again this morning. Uh, these drugs are sold on the internet and uh, by head and smoke shops <coughs> across the country. Uh, unfortunately, Duluth is unique in that we have one particular vendor, uh, we understand, uh, sells almost more synthetics than any place else in the country. Uh, the easy availability of these drugs has had and continues to have a devastating effect on our small community. Uh, locally, these drugs are promoted as being a safe and legal alternative uh, to the drugs that they uh, seek to replace, but I can assure you that they are neither. Uh, they've been designed by chem chemists to be more potent than the active ingredients in the drugs they replace. Uh, one of the bath salts compounds, uh, this was one of the original and most commonly found bath salts compounds, was estimated to be 10 times more potent than cocaine. Uh, the active ingredient in synthetic marijuana are estimated to be about five times more potent than THC, so the active ingredient in organic marijuana. We've heard discussion about the fact that they're packaged with other substances, some of them illicit, some of them dangerous. We really don't know what they're packaged with. Uh, now I'd like to give you a medical perspective on the problem of synthetic drug abuse and its effect on our patients in Duluth. The information that I have is from St. Luke's, uh, but I, I know Dr. Bilden is in the audience here as well, and I'm sure uh, her experience at Essentia is uh, very similar. We see patients uh, experiencing problems related to uh, synthetic drug abuse on an almost daily basis and sometimes several times a day. Uh, in the emergency department at St. Luke's, we've experienced a significant increase in the number of patients that require restraints. This refers to the physical tying down of agitated and violent patients to prevent them from hurting themselves and others. Uh, we've also experienced a 20% increase in the number of security activations from 2010 to 2012. This refers to the now frequent need to have security personnel assist us with restraining and holding agitated and violent patients. Most of the patients we see 
from synthetic drug abuse experience mild agitation and paranoia and can be treated with sedation, uh, reassurance, and a period of observation. They are often in the emergency room for a period of hours and are discharged to home. There are a significant number that will experience agitation, paranoia, delusions, and sometimes hallucinations to the point that they require more aggressive uh, sedation and end up being admitted to the mental health unit for admissions that last for days. And then there's a small number of patients, and we heard one example, uh, who present agitated to the point that they require aggressive sedation, restraint, chemical paralysis, and placement in the intensive care unit. And their hospitalization lasts for days. Now I'd like to give you a brief uh, but incomplete list of inpatient cases from January through March of 2013. To be clear, this is only a sampling of the cases that we cared for during that time related to synthetic drug abuse. I'd like to apologize in advance uh, uh, for the graphic nature of some of the cases that I'll be describing. <clears throat> First case, a uh, 37-year-old male intoxicated with bath salts observed to be running naked down the street uh, with his hand shoved in his rectum. Uh, he had to be tased. Uh, he presented with eight Duluth police officers and had to be placed in full restraints. He had a package of Riptide in his rectum. Riptide is a bath salts type product. He required aggressive sedation, chemical paralysis, intubation. He was admitted for six days. His hospital charge was about $40,000. A second case, 26-year-old male, prevents, uh, presents via ambulance with altered uh, thinking his girlfriend said that he had been abusing synthetics, quote, thought it was synthetic marijuana. Uh, he was staggering, fell, hit his head. He presented, again, agitated, sweaty, tremulous, uh, just like in the first case, had to be aggressively uh, sedated, chemically paralyzed, placed on a ventilator. Uh, he was found to have an intracranial bleed. Uh, he required a 40-day hospitalization. His hospital charges were $264,000. Next case, 35-year-old male presents uh, rambling and incoherent, making or homicidal threats. History, he had a history of bipolar disorder. He had relapsed on synthetic marijuana and marijuana. In the emergency department, he was observed to be uh, smearing stool on the walls. Required a six-day hospital stay, a $10,000 hospital charge. 19-year-old male uh, relapsed on synthetic marijuana was stopped by his mother as he was headed into the woods with a shotgun. He had a history of depression, three prior hospitalizations in the prior three months, two of which involved a gun. Uh, he admitted to being suicidal, and he required a 12-day hospitalization. Again, hospital charges over $20,000. Next case, 27-year-old male brought to the emergency department by family acting in a bizarre fashion. Uh, he had become agitated after using a substance called Kite. Uh, purchased at a local vendor. Uh, his wife and two small children were scared for their safety. He had had a prior history of substance abuse independence, but had been sober for seven years until he started using synthetics and now uses synthetics several times a week. He required a three-day hospital stay. A hospital charge is over $10,000. A uh, 34-year-old male, a uh, history of poly substance abuse independence, transferred from uh, the detox center. Uh, he, while there, suddenly became tremulous, agitated, and psychotic. Uh, required a, aggressive uh, sedation, was able to be admitted to the mental health unit. Uh, he was in the hospital for nine days, uh, over $25,000 in hospital charges. A 34-year-old male with a prior history of uh, schizoaffective disorder, so a mental health illness, uh, <coughs> presents uh, with the police uh, restrained, agitated, paranoid, delusional, he had synthetic marijuana in his possession. He was admitted for 24 days. Uh, hospital charges were 40,000. An 18-year-old male brought in by the Duluth police. Uh, he had been in jail recently for threatening his stepfather with a knife and became agi agitated while in court. Uh, he admitted to using bath salts and synthetic marijuana. Required a five-day hospitalization. Hospital charges over $10,000. Uh, final case, a 28-year-old male he was brought in after being found wandering naked outside in the cold. Uh, he lives with his parents. They were out of town at the time. 
Their home was found to be completely ransacked with multiple broken windows and packages of synthetic marijuana strewn about. He was hypothermic. Uh, he had developed rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury. He required a 20-day hospital stay. His hospital charges were about $40,000. Now these are uh, an incomplete collection of cases just from the first three months of 2013. We've had other cases in the past year uh, that are, are similarly dramatic. Uh, a man with schizophrenia who was using alcohol and bath salts who removed one eye with a fork and stabbed his remaining eye four times. We've had a young man who, uh, using synthetic marijuana, became agitated and proceeded to dig out several of his own teeth with his fingers. We've had a, a male with synthetic marijuana who broke up with his girlfriend, proceeded to lacerate his face 12 times with a knife. We had a young woman, uh, we've seen her now a couple times. Uh, she was brought in agitated, running in traffic. Uh, she believed that she was being chased by ghosts and admitted to using synthetics. And then finally, there was a, a male college student uh, screaming and paranoid after smoking synthetic marijuana found on his balcony by roommates. He had to be physically restrained. This was a balcony several stories up until the police could respond. To summarize the appearance or, or the, the experience at St. Luke's, most of these cases uh, are low acuity. They require basic sedation, reassurance, and with a period of observation, they can be discharged. Even this is a strain on the emergency departments as these patients sometimes utilize one of our beds for hours. The sicker individuals are very resource intensive, as you can imagine. They require aggressive medical care, security intervention, and psychiatric care. And the impact on both the patient and our healthcare system is significant. Uh, the impact on mental health care deserves special mention. There's a statewide shortage in the available inpatient beds for mental health. My review of multiple cases suggests that many mental health patients are abusing synthetics and the result is longer, more severe, and more frequent decompensations. This is straining an already broken system. The total effect is difficult to assess. Uh, there is no universal identifier or, or code that we use for synthetic drug abuse. Uh, the turnaround time for us uh, for a, a confirmatory test is about five days. Consequently, very few tests are done. Uh, anecdotally, and there's nothing to base this on other than my experience, I've worked in uh, emergency departments uh, in some capacity since 1987. That coincided with kind of the end of the crack cocaine era and uh, <coughs> covered the methamphetamine era. And I've not seen either the number or the severity of cases with either of those other drugs of abuse. Uh, so I, I think this makes it clear, synthetic drugs are neither safe nor legal. They're potent drugs marketed by savvy criminals in an attempt to circumvent what seems to me established law. Although we don't know the long-term effects of synthetic drug abuse, we can extrapolate from studies on the long-term effects of similar substances like cot, which is cathinone in Yemen, uh, and organic marijuana. These studies describe significant irreversible deficits in executive function for long-term marijuana users and a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease and mental illness for cot. The adverse long-term effects appear to be worse for heavy users and those who start in adolescence. The synthetics are promoted in such a way as they're 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 promoted in such a way as